So my name's Dan Smith. I'm a security researcher with interests in the automotive industry and financial sector. Um, I studied computer science at Lancaster and did a master's in cybersecurity. Um, I don't really have any formal background in car mechanics or car hacking. It's just stuff that I picked up over the years since the age of 17, really, uh, when I learned to drive. So I probably have about eight, nine years experience just tinkering around with cars, but it's, it's nothing specialized. You know, anyone can do it, really, uh, just with enough persistence and excellent Googling skills. So, yeah. So one thing I have actually started from when I started this project, one thing that has kind of led on from it, I have started the UK's first Open Garage. So Open Garages is a group of people that are interested in car hacking and automotive tinkering, really. It started in the US, and I started the UK's first one. Uh, it's just a vehicle research laboratory, um, and it's where I do a lot of my work, really, for, for, for fun. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about car hacking and some of my experiences and, and my journey so far. Uh, more specifically about the retrofitting of modern technology into classic cars. So it's probably a bit of a talk with a twist to other car hacking talks out there. So, you know, what do I actually mean by a classic car? Well, I do not mean one of these things. This is the Ford Model T introduced in 1908. Uh, it's an antique. You wouldn't really find one of these on the road, so it's not like this. It's not one of these either. This is a pre-war Volkswagen Beetle. Um, it's just too old, really. Um, this is the era that I'm most interested in. This is the like 1960s, 1970s, post-war era. So you have cars like the Jaguar E-Type, the Mini, the MBG, MGB GT coming into play. And, and really, they're kind of like simplistic cars compared to, to like modern cars. They're like the fundamentals put in place, and they still bear some resemblance to modern cars, and, but they're just much more simpler. And that's kind of really why I was interested in them more than modern cars, because I didn't have any background in in automotive. So it was a good starting place for me, really, like a, a good base learning platform. And then that's leading on to the modern area, which is where we are now, obviously, in the current world. Um, I've kind of compressed this category a little bit to include cars from the 80s and 90s, because they've just sort of evolved. And you know, up to now, you've got like Tesla Model S and BMW i8 are in this category as well. And uh, so I like to retrofit technology from this category and take it back to the previous category. And so, so that's what I do for fun, really. And this, this slide kind of like follows on from my previous point. Um, the cars like nowadays are just so complex um, and so simple at the same time. Like you open up the engine bay of any modern car and you're just presented with this glorious piece of soul-sucking plastic. And uh, you know, you kind of look at it and go, oh yeah, that's cool. But you have no idea how it works how all the systems fit together, the immense complexity of what's actually lurking underneath there. And so, you know, when I started, I was more tinkering around with things like this. This is, this is my car after I've been playing with it for a few years. Um, so it, it does look maybe more complicated than the last slide, but it's much more simple than you really think. And, um, you know, all the parts are nice and easy to play with, uh, easy to work with. Um, it's just so much easier as a starting point than starting off with a modern car. Um, so this is actually my car. This is the car that I do all my work on, really. Uh, this is a 1974 Ford Escort Mark I. Uh, it's my first car. I had it since, uh, again, I, was, I actually got this when I was 16, so before I could drive. Um, so when I first got the car, like eight or nine years ago, uh, it was pretty much stock, uh, as Ford would have made it in the 70s. Uh, no, none of the previous owners had really touched it. And um, I think most, you know, the most luxurious thing about it was it had a cigarette lighter and a reheated re windscreen, which is kind of rare for, for, for this era. Um, so yeah, it was stock. It was a 1.3 in line four with a three-speed automatic gearbox. So first gear gets you going, second gear is your power gear, third gear is your cruise gear on the motorway. So it really was not good. Um, so version 1.1 of that, I. Uh, kind of modded it a little bit and changed the three-speed auto gearbox to a four-speed manual. And that kept me going for a bit. And then uh, 
when I went to uni, I started increasing the mileage that I was doing. So I was going up and down the M6 between my home and Lancaster. And uh, so I started really racking up the miles and needed something that would be, be a bit more fuel efficient, which was something that I was concerned about. So I decided to operate the gearbox from a four speed to a five speed manual, uh, retrofitted out of a Ford Sierra. So that's from the 80s. So my car has just like jumped 10 years in the, in the future, really, in part of this drivetrain. And um, that, again, that kept me going for a while as well. And then towards the end of uni, I was like, what else can I do to make the car a bit more efficient? And um, this natu naturally let me on to uh, starting to mess around with some of the engine and some of the components that fit around with the engine as well. Um, so that's kind of really some of the stuff that I'm gonna be talking about today. And another driving force behind that, um, when I was at uni, I again was concerned with efficiency. So I really wanted a live miles per gallon uh, dash, like you know, one of them little functions that you have in any car now that tells you how, how well you're doing based on your driving. Um, so literally all of this is spawned from that one idea. And here I am eight years later, nearly starting to actually get to actually do what I wanted to do, um, which is talk about this. Yeah, so the three things I'm going to talk about today are we've got efficiency, um, which is where I'm going to dis discuss uh, actually converting a car from uh, carburetors to fuel injection, and some of the stuff I actually did, both hardware and software. And then that kind of got the ball rolling, and then I got hungry for a bit more, and I decided I wanted to pursue... Uh, oh. I'll kind of jump on a little bit. So yeah, then I got a bit more hungry and I decided that I wanted to get a bit more power. So I'm gonna go into how I, how I did that as well without implicating the efficiency of the car too much. And then finally, it was the overall digitization of the car uh, to really bring it into the 21st century. And uh, I luckily got to test drive uh, the Tesla Model S. So that was a big influence on some of the stuff uh, that I've done. Um, yeah. So first of all, um, the big thing was to get away from the old analog system of carburetors and move it towards the future, or like how all cars are now, uh, you know, fuel injection. So it's just a different way of delivering the fuel to the engine in a more efficient manner. So this led me down the road of installing an engine management system. So really the central computer that all of you will find in all of your cars today. Um, it's the one that's responsible for controlling the fuel the ignition and the timing of the car. Um, so again, my car had none of this and I had to build it all from the ground up and get it all working. Um, and then luckily a friend at uni told me about, um, uh, it was like a sort of like a DIY effort for building your own computer that controls your car and it was called uh, Megasquirt. Um, it's a dodgy name, but it's actually a very good piece of kit. And um, there's a really good community behind it as well. So that's uh, the engine management system that I use. So as you can see here, it kind of comes a, a large circuit board like that. And you, uh, you, you take delivery of it and you solder it together. And um, this was my, I've done soldering before from, from a young age, but this was the first soldering project that was quite serious. And it, it took me many hours to solder this together. I, I ran into a lot of problems and it was a lot of diagnosis, trial and error, but eventually I got a working board. And um, once, I, once I got it a bit further along, I, I put it in a case. And also, if you see the other circuit board that's there, that's uh, known as the gym stim. Uh, it's like a stimulator board, so it's a way of being able to bench test the circuit board, the, the other circuit board, to make sure that everything's running as it should especially because fuel um, you know, is involved and you're going to be driving this on the road and it's your own safety and other people's safety that are in the car as you and other people on the road. So you spend a lot of time, more time in this uh, part of the process than the previous, uh, more than any really, just making sure that the engine, the system is running as it should and it's reliable and there's no problems. I should add that this, uh, this Megasquirt um, you, you do have access to the source code, so you can tinker with it and you can play around with it. Uh, it's very good for education, for learning the fundamentals. And um, 
It has some really advanced features in it as well, which is why I chose it over, over all others. You can do cool things like water injection, which was you know, taken, uh, you know, I think that was banned in the F1 because it made so much power in cars. You can do launch control, so you can, like, like all the Ferraris and the Nissan GTRs, you can launch at the traffic lights. Um, boost control, you know, all sorts of cool things that if you put the time and effort in, you can take full advantage of. And it's a fairly, piece, it's a fairly cheap piece of kit. That's only about $500 from the States. Um, so yeah, I got, I got the computer all working, was happy with it. Next stage was... Um, next stage was to actually start uh, fiddling around with the car itself. And so what you're seeing here, this is the VR sensor for the crankcase angle. Uh, it's literally the main sensor that's responsible for informing the computer, like, sort of the timing of the engine. And uh, again, like, this, this is a very sensitive piece of the, the car. Uh, it's probably the most critical sensor above all. Um, uh, yeah, so it's one of the main inputs, is what I should say. And then this is one of the main outputs. This is the throttle body that I used. Um, so the fuel effectively is injected uh, through that rail and down into the, into the manifold, which goes into the engine. Uh, so this is one of the main outputs. It's where the fuel gets injected into the engine. Um, all of this I had to build from the ground up. Uh, what I was trying to do was, uh, like 40 years in the future, than my engine. My engine was from the 70s and this stuff is, uh, well, this is like 2010. So it, it was a lot, of, a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, initially, I, did, I didn't actually start off with this. I started off trying to use motorbike throttle bodies, which you, which you can use, but I got them off eBay and they, they turned it out not being very good. So, and then this is like the typical wiring diagram you can expect to be faced with when trying to do all of this. Initially, it was really overwhelming, but once you kind of break it down and go through it bit by bit, it's, it's really not that complicated. And this is much simpler than anything that you're going to find in any of your cars uh, today. Um, it just really highlights all of the most important parts. Um, yeah. So that's pretty much the engine management system. Uh, once you've got the computer and the car and all the parts fitting together, um, you, you kind of load up some of the software on your computer, you flash the firmware across to it. If you've made any changes in the code yourself, they, they get applied then. And then you open, up a, you open up another application, and then that's actually when you begin to tune the car and get it to, to run smoothly. Um, I cover that a bit later on. And so then the next thing that kind of came along after the fuel injection, so I made it a bit more efficient. And it was running really well, like much better than it ever ran on carburetors. And so then I decided I wanted a bit more power as well. So this kind of led me down the dark path of black magic, um, ultimately arriving at the door of forced induction. And so then I went scavenging around all the scrapyards for bits and bobs and ended up with a turbocharger off of a Vauxhall Vector. Um, so I converted that for petrol use and then started the removal of the engine again and uh, getting it ready for the, for the turbocharge. And so the, all the turbocharger does is really compress the air. It, it uses uh, heat recycled from the exhaust and it compresses the air going into the engine to make it more dense. And through doing that, you can inject a bit more fuel and get a bit more power, uh, where you actually get a lot more power. And it's what all auto manufacturers are doing nowadays. They're doing really small displacement engines, like one liter, 1.3 liters, three cylinders, you know, sometimes four, and they whack a big, well, an efficient turbocharger on the side, and that's how they're getting the power nowadays to keep up with the bigger cars, but getting really high miles per gallon. And so this is, you know, this was a bit before then, so it's just funny that that's how it's turned out now, but it's obviously sort of like the right way to go. And um, the car here, it took a bit longer than I intended because we started taking the engine out and fiddling around with the car, and then we realized that it was quite rusty. So it had to go off to the to the spray booth for a few months, but when it came back, it came back like this, and uh, we were starting to ready to, to put it all back together. Uh, this is just a quick photo of me uh, beginning to build the manifold. So I just took one of the original Ford manifolds, chopped the end off, and started to weld together a small box for the, to the turbo to sit on. And um, with a lot of welding, it ended up looking like this. And again, this is like a one-of-a-kind part. There's, there's no, nothing else like it in the world for this engine. Um, at the time when I made it, it, no one else had really done that. 
uh, using the parts that I had used and with fuel injection because it's more complicated. Uh, so I was really pleased and um, the engine ended up looking like this. Um, and then this is it in the car. Uh, and then pretty much we had to do a little bit of other mods to the engine, but I won't go into them. But effectively we just slapped it on the side and it, and it seemed to work pretty well. Um, and this is the car being mapped at the rolling road. So what he's doing here is he's, he's got the car strapped down to the floor and the rear wheels, it's a rear wheel drive car, so the, the rear wheels are mapped onto the rollers at the back and, um, and the car is then drove and each time he's driving the car, he's sat in the car with his computer fiddling with the values in the, com in the software you use to like create a profile for your car for the, for the, for the ECU. So, it, it, that was a full day, but um, by the end of the day, the car was fully running. Uh, the horsepower had gone from 55 horsepower, which is what Ford originally uh, designed the engine for, and it had gone to 110. So that was a pretty good power increase. And I was really pleased, actually, because the car got featured in uh, Classic Ford Mac. Um, I did the, pro the whole project, so the fuel injection and the turbocharge cost me under 1,000, and to buy these sorts of parts and do the rolling road and the engine management system, you know, if you could buy them, it would easily be a few thousand, probably more likely 5,000. So that was a really, it was a really good effort, I think. Um, and that kind of like leads me, so I got like efficiency, I, I got some power now. And then that, and that kind of like led me to finally getting back to what I wanted to do, which was create a digital dash that allowed me to view my miles per gallon. And so I'd gone through years of pain and effort to finally get to this point and, um, and this is sort of where I, I kind of got up to. So, as you can probably see on the table, uh, this, is the, this is the original dash that I got out of the car. And then this is now the digital dash that I've built. And it's built to closely re re represent the original. Um, the main reason why I wanted to build a digital dash was one, the live miles per gallon. Um, so, you know, I can bring that up whenever I want now. Uh, without having to have additional dials inside of the car to like ruin the, the aesthetics. Um, and secondly, now because I have uh, an ECU inside the car and I can do all of these cool things like launch control and water injection and boost control, I kind of want to be able to view all of that extra information that the engine, uh, the management system is capturing and outputting, but I have no way of seeing it. So by having a digital screen, you know, Similar to a smartphone, you can alter the UI to reflect whatever you want, really. And um, so, with a bit more programming, I'm going to get it to do all of the things I want it to do. But for now, it, it simply replicates the original with uh, Taco and RPM. Uh, it's it is. Oh, did you guys see this slide, or did I miss one? You haven't seen this one. Uh, sorry, I, I must have missed the keystroke. So yeah, this is the digital dash. Um, the, the, the blue, the horrible blue uh, dash, I, I bought that off a guy, but I haven't had time to fix, uh, fix it up yet to replicate the original. Um, but, it, but it is very, very close. And it is powered by a Raspberry Pi. So there's an 8-inch uh, 1080p screen in there powered by a Raspberry Pi 2, uh, soon to be a Raspberry Pi 3, just for you know, free upgrades. Um, it was the first project that I'd actually used the Raspberry Pi 4 for, for like a, a larger project, not just like a little prototype. And um, it was interesting. I was trying to get it to boot up in under 10 seconds uh, to get a fast boot time. I didn't want to put the key in the ignition and wait for the computer to be booting up for like a minute, which is uh, some other examples that I'd seen on YouTube that people had done. So uh, in order to overcome that effort, I, um, I looked at a few of the distros that are available, like the, the slimmed down ones of Linux, and I decided to make my own. So um, it's running like a, a customized version of Linux with minimal tools, only what I need to, to get the dash up and running as quickly as possible and, and display the information that, that I want. Um, this is sort of like the system architecture diagram for the dash. It's um, it's mainly focused around the Raspberry Pi, and there's two shields. So there's the Sleepy Pi shield, which is responsible for more of the power management. Unfortunately, the Raspberry Pi, as good as a board as it is, it does not include very good uh, power management by default. Uh, you literally plug the cable in, it turns on, you shut it down, 
it stays on in a sort of low power state, you physically have to unplug the cable again to actually get it to turn off. So the first big problem I had with this dash was I could get it to turn on when I put the key in the ignition, but I could not get it to, in a, in a safe way, get it to shut down again. Uh, you'd simply just be turning the power off and, and the, 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 the dash would just lose all power. So keep doing that a few times and you're going to start corrupting you know, some of the operating system on it. So the Sleepy Pi is responsible for effectively listening for the external event from the ignition key being turned off and then it's actually able to send a, a command over the GPIO ports of the Raspberry Pi and get it to shut down in a safe manner. And there's also a watchdog timer that does a hard cutoff after 60 seconds if um, the Raspberry Pi is not shut down. So it will stop your car battery from draining in a few days uh, if it does happen to crash on shutdown. And then the second shield that's on there is the canvas shield. So this is probably one of the only Mark I escorts in the world that actually has canvas retrofitted into it. And canvas is responsible for connecting all of the different sensors and devices in modern cars together and get them communicating. It's, it's really how they've, the cars have become so much. It's really the reason why cars have become so complicated nowadays. It, you know, there's not like a wire to wire going everywhere. There's like power and then two wires and other data channels and you really can't, you really don't know what's actually going across them data channels. And um, so I've actually taken that and retrofitted it into my car. And um, that is what is responsible for communicating with, uh, this is the ECU. So pretty much this dash, two wires going across, communicates with this. And this is, this is what sends information across to that and gets it to move the dials and such. I hopefully was going to get it working today, but unfortunately, just as I was putting it all together, the, the, the cable snapped and I was running a bit late at time setting up. So the dials would be normally be moving, but unfortunately, I, I couldn't get the cable working in time. And so some of the other things on the, on the, on the architecture diagram, I've got a 4G dongle, um, a Wi-Fi dongle, and a GPS antenna. So. And the 4G dongle, I'm currently not using, but I, I do intend to use it. Uh, so at the moment, it's simply just a dash and nothing more. Um, I have lots of development in progress. Um, as soon as you put a 4G dongle in, into that, it becomes internet connected, and what you can do with it becomes a different realm. And, and you know, that's what the auto manufacturers are starting to do now. Even with the cheaper models, uh, the volume models that they're producing, they're starting to make the cars internet connected to do weird and wonderful things. And um, I know a few of the auto manufacturers have started to run into trouble with cars being hacked and such. And you know, as soon as you put, uh, as soon as you make the car internet connected, you just open up to a whole new world of pain of problems that you have to deal with. And so, it is planned for me to make it 4G enabled and get it to do some cool stuff, uh, which is covered in the next slide. But right now, it doesn't have it, um, simply because I'm a little bit scared of it. <laughs> Um, I also plan to put a Wi-Fi dongle into it, so you can uh, effectively share. Uh, the, you can take the 4G signal and it rebroadcasts it over Wi-Fi to anyone else in the car that doesn't have 4G. Just a convenience, really. Um, it'll have GPS in there. Uh, the, the Mark 1 Escort was featured in Fast and Furious 6, I think, and since that film came out, it was the car that Paul Walker drove in the film, and since, since that film came out, they've just soared in popularity and a lot of people have been reporting having them stolen. So one of the things I want to do is um, develop my own GPS tracker. Uh, so you need a GPS dongle for that. Uh, so if the car does get stolen, you're able to find out you know, where it is, hopefully, and retrieve it. Um, so you have a GPS receiver for that, which receives your coordinates. And then you'd use the 4G dongle to transmit it to a server somewhere where you're able to view the data in like an application similar to Google Maps or Google Street View, um, Google Earth, sorry. Um, yeah, and kind of like from a more security uh, perspective on, on that as well, some of the other things I, I would like to have a play around with, with the Sleepy Pi, because it does use a, a really low power optimized Arduino to actually uh, do the controlling. Uh, so it does have quite a few more GPIO pins than the Raspberry Pi. So some of the things I would like to have a, an experiment with at some point is developing, developing my own um, a key fob to do keyless uh, unlocking and locking, and um, as well as some of the central locking, and you know, maybe even like uh, keyless completely uh, NFC sort of style uh, locking and locking of the car of the car. 
Um, but that, that's all future at this point. And then um, a bit further on down the line, I'd probably say I'm nearly at the end of phase one now. But phase two is develop some server-side uh, technology to, you know, if the car is stolen, uh, the GPS coordinates are transmitted somewhere where you're able to view them. So I, I'm probably going to build some, some stuff for that and uh, have a tinker around with building some back-end services that, that can process all of that as well as kind of take a leaf out of Tesla's book and as well as like copying their screen, um, sort of, uh, develop like a, an iPhone app that, you know, could potentially interact with the car and get it to do cool things like turn it on, turn it off, you know, lock, unlock, all of this like remote functionality. And, and, and I probably will make this project more open source so other people can contribute to it and um, be a lot more transparent than the automotive industry is at the moment. Uh, each automotive each automotive manufacturer seems to have their own way of make of, of making things and doing things and um, there's not really much standardization so this would be a way of maybe moving the industry forward a little bit more in that direction by offering a solution that is open that some of the larger automotive manufacturers maybe could contribute towards I don't know uh, for me at the moment it's just for fun uh, and you know I, I want to be able to lock and unlock my phone uh, my car from my phone and, by extension, my, my watch. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I... Oh, there is actually one more thing I want to try. Uh, it may work, it may not. It was working earlier. So I just need to take, take the laptop away for the moment. So this is something that I only got working a couple days ago, and it is a bit buggy, so it may or may not work, but we will soon find out. Just bear with me. So, so I recently got an email, um, and it was from Plural Site, and they were telling me about some of the tutorials now that you can watch for Amazon Echo and Alexa. So Alexa is Amazon's effort to be an alternative AI to um, technology such as uh, Apple Siri, uh, Microsoft's Cortana, and OK Google. So Amazon's also got theirs going, and theirs is a little bit more open than some of the others. So you can actually interact with it. And I've managed to get an implementation of it running on a, on a Raspberry Pi here. So it wouldn't actually take much effort to like retrofit this into my car, um, you literally just have to put a button somewhere in the dashboard, uh, have it connected to the Pi over the GPIO port, run some software on the Pi. That um, There's a guy in London, he's made a Python implementation of the version one of the Alexia API, and it seems to run OK. So that's what I'm going to try and run now, and um, we will see. So we will see. Hello. How are you? Great. Ready to help. <laughs> Tell me a joke. What do you call a cow with a twitch? Beef jerky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you can, it's, it's just like sort of pointless. You can, you, but it's also good at the same time. Um, you, so this is like actually uh, implementing the AI sort of one of the endpoints on the Raspberry Pi, but you can also take it to the other end and actually get it to, you can actually implement your own actions, so you can effectively dictate your own voice commands and actually get it to do stuff. And it's much more open than some of the other services available. And you know, this one, you can ask it really weird stuff and it's actually able to respond, so. Million eight hundred ninety-eight octillion five hundred ninety-nine septillion nine hundred ninety-nine sextillion nine hundred ninety-nine quintillion nine hundred. I think you get the, the idea. <laughs> and, and anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, if you want that in your car, then um, come talk to me after, and I'll give you the gist of what I've done. But um, that's pretty much it. <laughs>